Okay. Welcome everybody. My name is Francis Hayashida. I'm the director of the Latin American and Iberian Institute at the University of New Mexico. Uh, the Latin American and Iberian Institute promotes and supports interdisciplinary teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement to advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is designated uh, as one of seven priority areas of research for UNM and we proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through programming. We'd like to take a moment to recognize the traditional homelands of the Pueblo Sandia on which UNM sits. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to Indigenous peoples. I'm delighted to introduce our speakers for today, uh, Les Field, Laura Gunderson, and Felix Manuel Burgos. Les Field is a professor of anthropology at UNM. His research in Nicaragua, Ecuador, Colombia, and native California hinges upon establishing collaborative relationships with communities concerning the goals, methods, agendas, products, and epistemologies of anthropological work. Laura Gunderson is an anthropologist who received her PhD from UNM. She focuses on community-based solutions to health disparities. Her dissertation centered on contemporary Christian-based communities in Nicaragua who base their social justice activism on their particular interpretation of Catholicism. Felix Manuel Burgos is a linguist from Colombia he is a clinical associate professor at the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at NYU. Professor Burgos has a background in Latin American studies with a specialization in anthropology and linguistics and holds a PhD in Hispanic linguistics. His research interest is the application of critical discourse analysis from a semantic perspective to study ideologies of class and the production and reproduction of relations of power in Colombia. So thank you all for sharing your work with us today. Thank you so much for that very kind and wonderful introduction, Francis. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I, this is a maybe a little different than some of the other presentations that have happened at the LAII <clears throat> because it's really a conversation. And so the conversation is between myself and Lara Gunderson about the work that we have done in Nicaragua uh, and uh, around certain themes and uh, with uh, between myself and Felix Manuel Burgos around uh, the work that both of us have done in Colombia. I was the chair of um, Lara's committee. She graduated from the Department of Anthropology here at UNM in 2018. And I was a committee member for Felix Manuel uh, he graduated from the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, also here at UNM in 2013. So I have a, a long-term knowledge about um, um, my former students and their research and their trajectories. And uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be able to participate with them in, the, in this conversation today and to invite other people into the conversation. So um, I'd like to just first start with a kind of overview of the genesis of the project that brought us together talking about the subjects we're going to talk about today. Um, to be perfectly frank, I'm a child of the late 60s and early 70s. And that means that I was exposed to a lot of utopian thinking as a part of my uh, uh, coming up politically and academically uh, during that time period. Um, during that time period, there was a great deal that was written both in popular fiction, in movies, and also in the academic world um, that was of a utopian quality um, uh, from socialists, from Marxists, from feminists, from people of color, from the black movement, uh, from the Hispanic movement, the Chicano movement, from Native Americans. There was a plethora of utopian thinking um, that was characteristic of the late 60s and early 70s. That current, um, I can't precisely date it, but starts to dwindle uh, in the 1980s. And uh, 
eventually, I guess there's very little utopian thinking in the circles that we travel in today, academically and politically. And instead, utopian thinking has been replaced in large part by dystopian thinking. Um, and so I have been reflecting on that for some time um, without realizing that I was reflecting on that. So sometimes you have to sort of listen to your own thinking to realize, oh, well, that's really what I'm interested in. So I was, I was thinking, wow, there don't seem to be utopias anymore. There's so much utopian th dystopian thought in, again, popular fiction, in uh, visual media, in film, on the TV, um, and also in uh, academic work and political work. And so I started to talk to people about what they thought about this. And this was pre-pandemic. So in my travels in Colombia, uh, in, uh, in Europe, uh, and elsewhere, um, I asked people, particularly young people, what they thought about the displacement of utopian thinking and its replacement by dystopian thinking. And then the pandemic hit. And I realized soon uh, thereafter that much of the, of the events as they were going down were almost like a playbook of pandemic dystopias that had been written really actually since the 1970s uh, Michael Crichton's book, The Andromeda Strain, is the first pandemic dystopia that I ever read as a kid. And there have been a succession of those ever since, even to the point of a, and it's kind of almost scarily ironic, there was a game that I was playing in the pre-pandemic era, era called Pandemic, right? And some of you may be familiar with that game. So this was a part of our thinking even if we didn't realize, wow, we're thinking about this dystopia all the time. And uh, then with the election of Donald Trump in 2016, uh, the, the production of political dystopias, feminist dystopias, um, dystopias of, of fascism in the future also began to proliferate. So at a certain point in April of 2020, after the pandemic started, I realized that this is what I wanted to think about and talk about and write about um, for the foreseeable future. And so um, I started to talk to my students and ex-students about their work and how we had been thinking about utopia and dystopia in our work uh, without sort of being meta-conscious of it. We'd been doing that. And so this is, um, uh, these projects started to congeal throughout the course of 2020. Um, Lara Gunderson and I were talking about utopian projects um, linking the uh, utopian uh, thinking and work and vision of Ernesto Cardenal, uh, a really key feature in the uh, Nicaraguan revolution of the late 1970s and into the 1980s. And uh, one of the classic examples of a liberation theologist, Christian priest, Catholic priest, who was a Marxist as well, on the one hand. And on the other hand, Felix Manuel and I started well, really, we resumed a conversation that we had been having uh, from when he was my student about a part of Colombia, which the, the FARC, the major guerrilla group in, in, in Colombia, the Fuerzas Armadas Revolucionarias Colombianas, um, had controlled between 2000 and 2003 that Felix Manuel had actually been living in during that time. And I had way back in the early 2000s questioned him about that. And we got back in contact around talking about his experience there, which I qualified not as a dystopia, but as an anti-utopia, which I hope to clarify um, uh, in, in, in our conversation uh, to come. So these are the projects that we've been working on. Uh, Lara and I have already published an article, which I don't know if it was distributed to the uh, but it, it, it's an article in a, in a small uh, Latin Americanist journal called A Contra Corriente um, about our conversation that uh, brings in Lara's dissertation work with the Comunidades Eclesiales del Base, which are the liberation theology communities, and our conversation about their character as utopian communities and their connection to the work of Ernesto Cardinal, which we'll talk about first. And then um, uh, uh, the conversation uh, that uh, Felix Manuel and I have been having 
um, has not yet resulted in a publication, but we're we're working on it, and that will be uh, I I think uh, finished before too long. So uh, that's the brief introduction to the project and its scope, and what um, what we've been doing with with our conversations. And what I'd like to do next is to talk a little bit about Ernesto Cardinal, and then I'm going to invite Lara to relate her dissertation work and her uh, thoughts about the CEBs, the Comunidades Eclesiales del Base, as utopian communities and as connected to Cardinal. And then uh, that will be uh, uh, probably till around 2.30 around, and then uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit again to introduce uh, the, the project that uh, Felix Manuel and I have been working on. So um, I'd like to be brief so I, that uh, Lara has plenty of time to do um, uh, her part of the conversation. So Ernesto Cardinal, as I mentioned, was a Catholic priest. He was trained in contemplative con Catholicism by the famous theologian Thomas Merton. Uh, he was educated and received his training as a priest in both Mexico and it turned out, I found as a part of this project, found out in Colombia. And uh, he was uh, exposed to the Cuban revolution in the 1960s and began to uh, formulate combinations of, of um, what became liberation theology, which was not at that time quite liberation theology, but, but was the, the contemplative Christianity of Thomas Merton with his understanding of the Cuban revolution and of socialism as, as it was being enacted and planned in Cuba. Uh, he went back to Nicaragua in the mid sixties and bought an island in Lago Nicaragua, the big lake, where he created a utopian community called Solentiname. And on the island of Solentiname, which was habit, inhabited by impoverished fishing and farming people, um, uh, who were uh, in many ways isolated from the mainstream of Nicaragua, itself a very poor country, he introduced um, the arts, plastic arts and the arts of poetry in his mind as an activity of what in Spanish we call conscientización or consciousness raising uh, towards revolutionary analysis of society and revolutionary thinking. And so on the island of Solentiname, well, on, on the island of Mancaron, in the archipelago of San Solentiname, um, the farming and fishing people began painting, they began uh, 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 writing poetry and making ceramics. And uh, later that experiment, that, that utopian community was allied with the Frente Sandinista, the Sandinista Front, and was later destroyed uh, by a bombing raid of the Guardia uh, Nacional, the, 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 the dictator's private army. Um, and Ernesto Cardinal went on to affiliate with the Frente Sandinista and to become, uh, um, under the, the revolutionary government, the Minister of Culture uh, under the Sandinistas, which, of course, the Sandinistas of the late 70s and 80s were a very, very, very different group than the ones that we see in power today under Daniel Ortega, which Lara will no doubt also refer to. So Ernesto Cardinal's life as a revolutionary, as a priest, as a, as a Marxist was, was complex and composed and comprised of multiple strands and elements. Um, his career as the Minister of Culture was really quite also amazing. Um, uh, that's where I encountered him in my dissertation work because I worked for the Ministry of Culture and um, my, my, my work and my thought was deeply entwined with his uh, in my dissertation. So, um, I'm going to stop right there uh, at, at, at 2.15, and I'm going to invite Lara to come in and talk about her dissertation and what she found in terms of utopian thinking, utopian politics in the CEBs, and her further thoughts about that. So, Lara, hi. <laughs> hi, Les. <laughs> okay, here I go. Um, so, really, I'm going to introduce the Christian-based communities. Um, that were really developing in Managua around the same time as Cardinal was uh, was in Solentiname, um, and uh, then maybe we can get into some some conversation and stuff too. So, um, Christian-based communities in Nicaragua 
um, Comunidades Eclesiales de Base. They call themselves the CEB, C-E-B. Um, so I'll call them the CEB too. Um, they emerged after the Catholic Church's Second Vatican II Council um, from 62 to 65, if, if anyone is versed in their Catholic history, <laughs> out of the reforms, and then the Medellin Conference in 68, which was really um, to figure out how to implement the reforms in Latin America. And, um, and in that spirit of the proclaimed preferential option for the poor. And the SEBs ended up becoming the model to organize Catholics who wanted to practice their faith, um, especially in places that had a shortage of priests. Um, and liberation theology too, importantly, focuses on helping impoverished people free themselves from structural inequalities. During my field work, um, I wanted to talk about one, uh, one example. They, the SEBs are super um, involved in um, like identity workshops, um, agrarian reform workshops. And one of the workshops that took place in a little um, rural community in a community house focused on identity. And on the poster paper, um, the SEB uh, facilitator um, talked about um, the SEBs as a model for a future socialist society. And, and they had divided the church history into three models. Um, and this person started talking about um, in the first centuries of Christianity um, and having the church become more set, you know, centralized over the centuries um, with Constantine and then the development of the Pope as having this absolute power. Um, they went on to talk about the French Revolution, the emergence of Protestantism, the Industrial Revolution, and capitalism. And the speaker in this rural community then defined capital and money as being false gods and asserted that the church had situated itself within the capitalist system. And the final model to come out of this is the church of the poor, which is the people who practice the liberation theology. And the idea of the church of the poor is that the members actively work to free themselves or liberate themselves and others from the constraints of capitalism that impoverish them um, both economically and spiritually. And so they talk about bringing a kingdom of God, they say a kingdom of God on earth. That's what they are working toward bringing about. Um, and they use different words for that, but it's very, I mean, their religiosity is strong. I, uh, when I first started, um, you know, looking into to doing field work and researching them, um, you know, a lot of literature about them had been on their political involvement. And during my field work, I realized I was working with actually people who were just very Catholic, deeply Catholic, deeply religious, um, and they were just trying to practice their faith. And so they say kingdom of God on earth, but they also use egalitarian society, liberation, socialism, um, but that religious language is really primary for the Sebs. And they hold that this was Jesus's project and that they as Christians must work for an egalitarian society. And so with this religious language came prophetismo um, to denounce the structural sin that is capitalism. They call it a, a structural sin, inequality, economic inequality, and to announce something better, that they can build um, something else. And they used, you know, um, years back, Otro Mundo Es Posible was, was really trendy. And this is this was in their language and in their documents too, to build another world, another world is possible. Um, and so they were working for this like transformative society, um, announcing that it can come. And they did work um, in conjunction with the Sandinistas and, and were instrumental in bringing in that Sandinista revolution um, that Les mentioned. In the 80s, the church was extremely um, threatened by them because they didn't need the hierarchy of the priests to practice, and they were exiled from the churches in Nicaragua, and they were forced to practice their faith in each other's homes, in little communities. Um, and it was Padre Arnaldo Centeno, who I wanted to mention, um, who arrived from Mexico to Nicaragua in, in 82, who continues to accompany them in this day, um, and, and is, who's really the primary shaper and guide of, of the SEBs. And they call him a guide. They call him an advisor, a faithful friend. Um, I mean, he loves them. He values this kind of practice. Um, and they perceive him as to embody, embodying those Vatican II reforms and Medellin reforms as well. 
How's that for an introduction? Should we, <laughs> should I keep going? Should we talk? Sorry, I had to get unmuted. Well, Laura, can you tell us a little bit about how you feel that the work of um, the SEBs and the work of Ernesto Cardinal are aligned or not aligned? And mm -hmm. Would you qualify the SEBs as utopian thinkers? Yeah, okay, so I think that, I think they are utopian thinkers and in a really interesting way, you know, in the face of this, you know, myself included, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, this anti-utopia or dystopia you, you talked about. I, you know, my time spent with them was, wow, in the face of all of this, these people have asserted a, a, a kind of utopian future um, still and continue to do, ha have not lost it. Um, and the reason why I, I mentioned how religious they were is I think that's a pretty big reason why they can continue to do this. Um, and so maybe I want to focus on, I think, um, talking about uh, profetismo and um, which, and what I mean about that is the denouncing and announcing, essentially, like I mentioned, but they, they're constantly denouncing this corruption, including of um, not all of them, this is a, a you know, a, a debated um, issue, but denouncing like the current Sandinista government, for example, and announcing um, their base values of, of uh, living um, in a more socialist society. And so I think they have continued to um, uphold this utopian um, thinking. But when you asked me to look at what they said about Cardinal, I went back to my field notes and what I found was them talking about Oscar Romero over and over and over. It was Oscar Romero more than Cardinal, much more than Cardinal. Um, Padre Almaldo talked about Cardinal, Ernie, and, um, and would, would um, you know, quote him and mention him. And, and certainly the Sebs knew Cardinal from, you know, their history um, and what they lived through the 70s and 80s. Um, but they talked about Oscar Romero, who is not a Marxist, who is um, maybe not, uh, you know, um, who, who was at one point, you know, involved with the, um, the richer society of El Salvador. And, um, but he was their guide. He, you know, and he changed to realize, no, I, what my job is to do is to, you know, speak for the poor and to um, defend the lives of the poor. And, and so it's Arnaldo and, and Romero for these people who seem to be this break or the, the, the transformative guides that they're following um, to uphold this like kind of utopian future. Well, it's interesting how <clears throat> radical and revolutionary thinking manifest with different Catholic priests during the last half of the 20th century, right? Um, Very much so. Right, the connection to Colombia um, is also interesting. Um, Cardinal um, was in Colombia um, studying at a seminary in the Departamento de Antioquia during the period in which a, 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 an extremely charismatic Catholic priest named Camilo Torres was active. Uh, Camilo Torres later affiliated with the second largest guerrilla group in Colombia, the Ejército de Liberación Nacional, and was killed in combat. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's questions about, uh, was he a Marxist or was he a revolutionary that saw the utility of, of Marxist thinking, but wasn't necessarily identified as a Marxist. And, and Oscar Romero, of course, was in no way a man of the left, and yet he became a symbol of the, of, of the revolution in, in El Salvador. So um, I think, and, may, and maybe I could ask you if you agree whether uh, the, the sort of overall rubric of utopian thinking brings in many different possible currents. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and I think even in the sub development, um, they had many different possible currents. I mean, there was, um, you know, the families of God uh, in the, in the, you know, the very first SEB in Nicaragua, um, 
they received their training in Panama with the families of God and they were called families of God. And um, meanwhile, the Capuchin uh, folks on the Caribbean side were developing um, other Christian based communities. The ones in the Northwest part portion of, of Nicaragua were influenced by the El Salvador Sebs. Um, where Romero was. And, and so there were all these different strands in Nicaragua itself, and they were aligned really in how to address the plight of the poor, the majority of people who have been made impoverished by, um, you know, by the, the current, the economic, you know, environment in which they were living and, and, and trying to survive. Sorry, I'm clunky with the unmute. Um, thank you, Lara. That's, that's really interesting. There's so much more to discuss. There's so much more to think about in terms of um, who are the protagonists of revolutionary thinking, right? Um, in Marxism, obviously it's the working class, but in Nicaragua, it was this idea about los pobres, the poor, or, or uh, the, the, the majority, the, the poor majority of people which of course is the great and was the great majority of people in Nicaragua. So um, that's, this is, this is a, I think, an amazing example of one of the most impoverished and one of the most really, at this point, politically oppressed nations in the hemisphere where utopian thinking continues to be relevant. Yeah, it does. And, you know, I, internally with among the subs, they're not even united in, in how to, you know, in this current reality in, um, you know, the, I think they would be united in how they talk about the poor, but not how they align with um, any political, you know, leadership or, or powerful leadership. Um, you know, the founding said that, that it emerged as a family of God in the 60s. They um, reportedly have um, are, are practicing sovereignly again um, because they decided to stay supportive of the current Sandinista government, whereas other Sebs um, in Managua, in the capital itself, said, "No, we're denouncing them. They are not upholding the Sandinista values that we hold dear." And it's a, it was a big break. And so, while in my field work, they were working at this relaunch, this relanzamiento, um, the last few years have seen. Um, new breaks emerge. Thank you so much. It's it's enlightening to think about people who live in, in Nicaragua who, quote unquote, don't have the luxury to think in utopian terms and do. Yeah. Right? Right. And do. Well, this is not to cut off this conversation, but we're going to move on to the second part of the conversation, which is uh, with Felix Manuel Burgos. And I'm going to say a few words about the project that we're working on and, and this concept of anti-utopia. Um, so dystopia, right, is in some senses um, uh, the opposite of utopia in the sense of utopia is where everything that is possible and, and uh, beneficial and what one would hope the best that humanity could achieve is achieved. Uh, however that might be defined. And dystopia is where all the worst things that exist today or in the most sort of nightmarish parts of our past become themselves dominant. So uh, a, a fascist dystopia, right, is uh, often like say in, in a show like The Man in the High Castle, it's a, a, a fantasy of, of Nazism and uh, uh, Japanese militarism as having been the victors of the Second World War and um, uh, ruling the world. So it's, it's a kind of, of kind of taking of the negative and making it the dominant. And anti-utopia is, I think, as I've defined it and as we've talked about it, um, Felix Manuel and I, as a rejection of utopia, a rejection of the kind of um, possibilities that utopia holds out. It's not necessarily a dystopia, but it's a rejection of utopia. And so, what we've talked about is how the FARC became an, an anti-utopian guerrilla group. And um, in our work, we've, we've, we've talked a great deal about the beginnings of the FARC. Um, we are, the starting point of our conversation is this place called the Zona de Espeje or uh, 
zona uh, uh, de, de desmilitarizado um, or the zona de despeje de San Juan de, de Caruan um, um, and other names that have been aff um, affixed to it. And this was a zone of about um, 16,000 square miles with a population of perhaps 10,000 people that the Colombian army, police and state disengaged from in the year uh, 2000 uh, in order to facilitate peace negotiations with the FARC. Uh, the FARC, which had begun, which had organized in the early 60s and uh, continued into the uh, end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, and in some ways is still going strong. And so uh, my question was, from what little I know about what I'll call the ZDD, the Zona de Despeje, was um, unlike liberated zones that say the FMLN or the Sandinistas had created during their wars with the governments that they uh, struggled with in the late 1970s and early 1980s, the FMLN in El Salvador, the FSLN in Nicaragua, when they would, would come to take a territory, they would set up in those territories the kind of model for what they wanted the revolutionary society to be. So in a liberated zone, what they called the liberated zone, they would enact public health programs, education campaigns, uh, all sorts of organizational efforts to show as a model and as a kind of a seed of what the future revolutionary society could be like, right? And when the FARC controlled the ZDD, it was anything but a liberated zone. Uh, in the territory of the FARC, um, they conducted, of course, a great deal of military training and military exercises in uh, preparation for future battles with the Colombian army and the Colombian state. They also grew and processed coca, coca paste, and, co and purified cocaine, um, which uh, had become by that point the main source of income for the FARC. They also uh, took kidnapped people, uh, which is another source of income for the FARC, is kidnapping uh, wealthy and even not so wealthy people and holding them for ransom. And these people were also stashed, so to speak, in the ZDD. So, um, the ZDD became, if you will, a center of criminal activity and in no sense a center for kind of the model revolutionary society. Um, in our conversations, uh, what, what we have sort of covered is the birth of the FARC at the, uh, during the period in Colombian history, which is referred to as La Violencia, which erupted in 1948 and in many ways became a sustained campaign of warfare against the rural poor in Colombia. Okay, uh, uh, a campaign in which the campesinato, the, the, the peasantry was under consistent and violent attack, um, mainly by the forces of the conservative party, but not only them um, and uh, the, the result was a, 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 an incredible dispossession of the lands of the poor uh, campesinos, the poor peasants, and the beginnings of, of, of Colombia's um, internally displaced crisis, right? Uh, whereby Colombia became the country in the world with the second largest um, population of displaced people. Well, that starts with La Violencia, right? And so these displaced people um, frequently ended up at what uh, in many uh, countries in Latin America are called uh, la frontera agricola, the agricultural frontier, which is sort of the, the edge at which of, of where farming is taking place and on the other side of which is typically tropical rainforests, sometimes other kinds of vegetation zones like in, in you know, high plateaus and so on. Uh, and so the, the displaced camp campesinos, displaced peasants sought refuge in in uh, remote uh, locations at the agricultural frontier, where in uh, the 1950s, they set up new communities and, uh, and armed themselves to protect themselves against the, uh, the, the uh, depredations of, of um, the conservative party, uh, for sure, and other, other armed forces that were operating. 
Uh, the radical wing of the Liberal Party was affiliated with these communities, and also the Colombian Communist Party was affiliated with these communities. And um, by the end of the 1950s and into the early 60s, these communities, um, they weren't extremely large, but they controlled some substantial space, if you will, uh, in remote regions in the interior of Cauca, uh, Caqueta, uh, Meta, uh, Putumayo uh, departments. And uh, the Colombian uh, media, in a way that uh, Felix Manuel is well acquainted with, uh, utilized a kind of rhetorical device to uh, justify the violent repression of these communities. Uh, the Colombian media identify these communities as repúblicas independientes, independent republics, which of course ired both the upper class and, and people in the middle class of Colombia as how dare anyone try to uh, uh, separate off from the Colombian state. And this rhetoric justified a campaign of violent destruction whereby uh, the, the, these uh, communities were destroyed. And by the way, with the help of the US Green Beret uh, before they were ever involved in Vietnam, which is, which is shocking, um, but the United States was deeply involved. And so um, the refugees from the, uh, these communities, these armed communities of displaced peasants, along with activists from the Communist Party and from the Liberal Party, they were the nucleus of the FARC. They were the people who formed the FARC. And so the formation of the FARC is at the very point of the destruction of utopian communities, if you will. Those, the, those communities that had been set up by these displaced peasants where they, they practiced a kind of communal life and, and set up a, 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 kind of, uh, a kind of liberated zone for themselves, they were blown apart. And it was the, that was the birthplace of the FARC, was the destruction of utopian communities. And so Felix Manuel and I have, I, I suppose, agreed that that is the sort of uh, mechanism by which the FARC's vision of, its, of the future of Colombia is anti-utopian because they come out of the destruction of utopian community. And so um, it's, it should be no surprise in some ways that the, that the ZDD was uh, not a liberated zone along the lines of the Central American guerrilla movements that I was very familiar with before I ever went to Colombia, and that it uh, was oriented around very different sorts of goals and motivations. And I'm gonna stop there, and I'm gonna invite Felix Manuel into the discussion uh, to talk about uh, the FARC, its beginnings, and also primarily to talk about his experience of life in the Zona de Espeje, in the ZDD, in the early 2000s. All right, thank you very much, Les. Very happy to be here, back to my alma mater, just my former professors. And yes, I agree with what you say that probably the one of the reasons why the Zona del Espeje didn't become um, la, una zona liberada in the traditional sense of what you mentioned in Central America had to do with the fact of the origins of the FARC itself, but it also had to do with the purpose of the Zona del Espeje for the FARC that instead of being a place to show what they could do in Colombia, to the rest of the population, this would be our model if we take power, it was more a place to negotiate and prepare to the war. So this was not an example of the possible social uh, order in the future, more uh, a space to retreat, train, and launch the bigger attack. And this is important because the FARC Stop being a traditional guerrilla movement in around the um, end of the 90s of attack and leave. They moved to a world of positions. They were contrary. They were attacking big bases, big military bases, and that empowered them to feel that they were capable of actually taking power. So, Sona de Espeje wasn't an example of their pro um, social or economic reforms, was more an advance, a military advance. So at that point, I'm going to tell you more about my experience, personal experience. I didn't go there as an academic. I was an um, undergraduate student. And when the Zona de Espeje started, 
uh, there was a NGO who offered uh, students from public universities like mine, Universidad Nacional, the opportunity to go over there and support kids um, because some of the teachers of that area left when the FARC took control. So I was a very um, idealist student. I was um, definitely left wing, still are, <laughs> more radical, let's say. And in that, in that time, we had this idealistic view of the FARC and we were thinking that probably we were gonna see a lot of Che Guevara's. And who knows, probably we can one there in La Zona. So there was this intrigue about who they really are because you always saw the FARC on the screen of the TV. And this was an opportunity to finally see uh, the FARC directly and also to be in one of the most beautiful places of Colombia. That is this contradiction of the guerrilla being because they are there, there's no contamination, there's no hotels, there's no industry. So some time, in some way, the presence of guerrilla end up being very good for the environment <laughs> in, the, in Colombia. So I'm gonna show you, you allow me to share this screen. Uh, Marlene, can I share my screen with you guys? Yeah, just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, now it should work. All right. Thank you. So, in the south of Colombia, as you know, Colombia has the mountains. This, the Andes, right? And most of the population of Colombia live in this area. This is a very, very unpopulated area of Colombia. All these, the Amazonas, Los Llanos, in this specific part, which is the center um, where the FARC started, that is around this area. So when the FARC start uh, doing these military actions, the government decided to have peace talks. But one of the problems with these peace talks is that there wasn't a truce. War continued in the rest of the country and negotiations in the zona de despeje. So the situation was very tense because anything that could happen over there outside the zona de despeje could break the talks. And that's what happened at the end. And that's what we have to do. It was, um, they, they kidnapped a um, senator and that was what he called la gota que rebosó la copa and everything. Well, so La Macarena, the area of the zona de space is around the size of Switzerland. It covers five different uh, municipios, San Vicente del Caguán, Cartagena del Chera, San Jose de Coaviare, Mesetas, and obviously La Macarena, that was the place where I was. La Macarena is crossed by a river that is very important for Las Farc, which is the Guayabero River. This is the, the highway of Las Farc, where they can move all around this, this territory. As you see, it's a very, very small town. And now in this sat satellite image, it looks definitely bigger than the one that I saw. And we, I used to live five hours walking from here. So let me tell you, when I arrived, this is the shock of seeing that part for the first time because you left the airport in Bogota with a lot of military from one side. And when you land to the other, you receive by their enemy. So it's interesting to see just in a flight, the contrast between the two people. So I was very excited to see guerrilleros and especially, uh, let me show you. And especially guerrilleras. I was in love with all the guerrilleras that I was seeing <laughs> at that time. So this, they, they were on the town. They were moving around. And the first thing that shocked me was the difference between them. I assumed because of they call themselves the self Marxists that there was going to be an egalitarian army. And it was very clear that they were different frentes in, in the type of plant. And I ended up learning that the difference had to do with the amount of money that they can bring to the FARC. So instead of each frente putting all the money together and then distributing to all the, the frentes, they kept the money for themselves. So there was this difference of the frentes who have control of territory where that was coca, or they were more, or they were more able to kidnap people that they, you can see in their uniforms, in their guns, even 
they were gorgeous, they were not flacos. Oh, well, it was very evident that that discourse of equality didn't apply to the different frentes. So this is one of the first shock and experience in terms of what we expected to see or the people that we were talking. The other shocking thing is was that there was not a political discourse in them. It was more the military discourse in part of this is that the zona de despeje was controlled for one faction of the FARC, which was known for being very militaristic, which is the Mono Jojoy part, not the one that is related to the people that went from the Communist Party. They were students and end up more in the mountains. So the FARC itself had different, uh, let's say, um, military um, political groups within the FARC. It wasn't established. And they were more militaristic, more towards taking the power, and less about what we're going to do when we have the power. So um, this is me at that time. <laughs> this is the, the Guayabero River. This is what I have to cross in order to get to my school. And I, I live there. I live in my school because it was five hours from it from town, so the only place where I can stay was inside the school, which was this one. This was my room. And we have a little uh, library over here, and this was the classroom. That time I had, um, we started with 80 students. This day they didn't come to class, but this was usually the scenario of any given day teaching. So in this case, I think that he's asking me a hard question by me, I pose because I'm not understanding what he's saying. <laughs> and it, as you can see, it's very rudimentary. Uh, we were just doing the basic things, trying to learn how to write and read, and some, ge some geography, some history. I remember that I was trying to introduce the concept of art because Las Park didn't want me to teach art. That was the other problem. They told me that it, was there to teach them how to read and write and not to make bolitas with their hands. So I had to explain them that the bolitas with their hands had a purpose in their development of the brain. This was all come back and forward in terms of my pensum, what I wanted to teach and what the far thought that I should be teaching. And also have this problem with problems with the community because they felt also that I was wasting time teaching them art or talking about history when they were uh, in, more interested in more pragmatic uh, of what they saw as pragmatic things to learn try it. So this is PE. This is when we have time to, to swim in the river. These were my kids. So you see they had different <laughs> ages. So I had a group, the smallest was a uh, six years old and uh, biggest all this was 13 years old but i have to teach them all at the same time this is a laboratory in the area that i was living uh, most of the economy was based on on coca the but it was very poor so sometimes you would assume that if um territories uh, there's coca there's money but it wasn't the case it was very, very cool. And um, the involvement of the FARC with the narcotics was another thing that broke this idea of utopia over there. So what we knew before is that the FARC just taxed the, the production of coca. They were not directly involved. But then when we were there, we realized that the only buyers of coca were the FARC. And they were saying that they did this because many of the narco traffickers were giving fake money to the peasants. So in order to avoid this, they decided we're gonna be the ones collecting the coca, we're gonna be paying in real money, and then we're gonna be selling this to the laboratories. But this is the only thing that we do. We just move the money, uh, the coca from the peasants to the laboratories and charge, I think it was a uh, one or 2%. But definitely, they were more involved than this. And the things that end up happening is that there was a community, community, communal radio 
where they announced where, this, where there was gonna be the buy. This is when the farm had the money, the cash to pay the coke and the peasants with the coke that they already have, the, the base coke, right, will go there and sell it to them. So everyone was always listening to this station and say that in a weekend, they'll say today in Isla Brava. So everyone run to Isla Brava with whatever they had in terms of coke, they will make a line, the FARC will count how many people were there, divided the money that they have among the people and say, today we're gonna buy just one kilo and a half or two kilos. The idea was that everyone gets something. So even if you have eight kilos, they wouldn't be able to buy it because they want everyone to at least be able to sell something. And that was routinary. And in the moment that they were sell the, the little town, crazy pandemonium that day, everyone started drinking, prostitutes were coming, gamblers, everything. It was another world during the sell of coca. And after that, it became to the regular poor state. So the FARC didn't control also what people were doing with the money. That was also shocking with me, for me, because one of the things that I was telling my the parents of my kids is that uh, one of my students that is over here, sorry, that he was over here, is neither needed new boats because his feet were growing. And I was insisting them the next time that you get money, we need to buy him boots, his boots, his boots. And now they, they drank it all. So I asked with the moms of the community to please keep the money for the, for the kids. But what I was trying to say is that the FARC didn't apply um, an economy of social well being. Most of the money that I was made to the coca was waste on these um, gamblers or prostitutes and they just left the area, leaving no money to the zone. So it ended up happening once that the army decided to close the territory, to, to make a circle of the territory, and it, it, there was not catch coming into it, no catch of any kind. No, that far wasn't, be, wasn't able to buy. So all the kitchens, start to stock with uh, coca base. I remember having breakfast among tons of tons of coca base, seated on coca base, and we wouldn't uh, be able to sell it to change it for money. So what ended up happening is that I asked the community for my salary. It was very small, but it was the money that I used to transport, to cross the river. And it, they were very embarrassed about not being able to give me the little money that they promised, but they say, okay, what we're gonna do is to give you this coca in exchange for you to keep. And in the moment that we sell, you can give it back and we'll give you the money. So I took it and assuming what I'm gonna do with this, definitely I'm not gonna use it. So you know, <laughs> I don't know where I'm gonna put it. So I decided to go to the river. And when I went to the river, there was this barca and I stopped him from the side. And I told the driver, the conductor of the lancha, that I didn't have any money, but I just had some coca base. So he told me, okay, one spoon for the trip. I told him, no, oh, that's too much. Half on a half on, on a spoon. Okay, half on a spoon. And when I went to the to the town, same thing happened when I wanted to buy groceries. But instead of uh, giving money, I was giving coke. And what ended up happening, I was not the first obviously doing this, is that the coke, the coke became the currency. So it was interesting to see, for example, an old lady with a crucifix, very conservative, paying with coke, <laughs> the, the things that we were buying. And the coca paste became currency for two weeks, I think, something like that, after the FARC could bring cash and everything went back to normal. But that was the, one of the experiences that I remember the most about how the FARC in the, the Zona de Espeje changed all the structure, economic, social structure of the communities here. 
at the end, uh, what happened is that, um, as I told you, a senator was kidnapped. We always heard uh, um, we were depending of helicopters. And there were helicopters usually occasionally. So the son of Espejo wasn't respected by the army. And we knew that because we heard the army helicopters. But the helicopters, the presence of the helicopters intensified. So in one point, I was very scared with the kids because we were thinking that probably they were going to shoot the school because we were very visible from the, from the air. So I asked the community to write a escuela on the roof for the army to see. But at the same time, we didn't know if they were going to respect that, the fact that we were a escuela. So uh, we did this drill with the students that every time that we hear an helicopter, we will run to the same position in the river. It was next to this part of the river. It was a big stone. So we all sit in there in any specific order. First the little one, then the second, and I was the last to get there. So we train in the school every time that we have an helicopter, I would say helicopter, and I will count the time. How good are we doing in getting into the, under the rock? And what ended up happening with the kids is that every time that I had to say something like, examen de matemáticas hoy, helicóptero, and all of them end up running <laughs> to, to down the, the river. And that became like a ritual, the helicóptero. But then when it int intensified and intensified, the, uh, the NGO told us it's time to leave. You need to leave. It's clearly this is going to end soon. In the army, is not the problem. The, the problem is the paramilitaries. The paramilitaries is, are going to be coming. And if they see you, definitely they will assume that they are, you are supported of the FARC and you'll definitely be killed. So it was this tension with the community because I felt like I have to leave for my safe. But at the same time, it felt like a it betrayed to the community because they were hoping that the presence of someone from the city will help them to survive the, an attack from the paramilitaries, that in some way, someone white that spoke well and being as a professor could be a shield from the attack. Uh, so when I told them that I couldn't stay, that I needed to leave, so I was afraid. I remember the kids that talking to me that was really sad. I always expected that we have a proper goodbye and they didn't want to talk to me. So the last uh, memory that I have of them is seeing them on their houses, me passing and saying, bye, it's not there. bye, uh, ciao, Pedrito. And they just looked at me sad without saying anything and I left. We got to the town and there was many people trying to leave the area. Uh, we finally could get a flight and that took us to Villa Vicencio. And well, that was the end of my experience in that zona de espera. Felix Manuel, thank you for sharing what is uh, certainly a, a series of both uh, strangely amusing, but also terrifying memories. Um, and I, I hope that those, uh, what, what Felix Manuel described for us uh, is a is a testimony to what we have called anti-utopia, which is a rejection of utopian notions, not necessarily a dystopia, but a rejection of of struggle for utopian ideals or utopian visions. Um, there is so much more we can say, but we're we're right at three o'clock, and and I'm wondering, Marlene, we we should take questions at this point, right? Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, unless anyone else has any.